Namaste, everyone. Welcome to the Charvak Podcast. This is your host, Kushal Mehra. My guest today is Dr. Gad Saad. Dr. Saad is one of the uh, you know best-known public intellectuals fighting the tyranny of political correctness, which is what this book is about uh, today that we are going to be discussing today. And he's a professor at the, of marketing at the John Molson School of Business at Concordia University, where he's held the research chair in evolutionary behavioral sciences and Darwinian consumption from 2008 to 2018. He's a pioneer in the application of evolutionary psychology to consumer behavior. He's the author of The Evolutionary Basis of Consumption, The Consuming Extinct, and numerous scientific papers, and the editor of the book, Evolutionary Psychology in the Business Sciences. Uh, you can read his blog at Psychology Today. Also, he's been covered by Wall Street Journal and multiple podcasts. But today, we're going to be discussing Dr. Saad's latest book, which is called The Parasitic Mind, How Infections, uh, Infectious Ideas Are Killing Common Sense. So, Dr. Saad, thanks a lot for coming on the podcast. Oh, thank you so much for having me. Cheers. So, Dr. Saad, so before we get, get into the discussion of the book, I have to put this on record. Actually, it was your book, book The Consuming Instinct, that... Uh, in no small way, literally changed the way I think, actually. So I was one of those people who always used to wonder, why don't we have evolutionary principles being used, or, you know, as you like to call it, above the chin? So I, I would always wonder, and I'm not from a scientific background, so I would be like, I don't know, maybe it doesn't apply or something. And then I actually accidentally came across your work, your previous book, and then I read The Consuming Instinct, and, and then it was like, you know, it, it's almost like a tube light went off in my brain. I was like, oh, we can think about it like that. And then I obviously, you know, literally started binge watching your YouTube channel. And whenever you would recommend a book, I would actually write down the name and I would read all those books too. So before we start today's book discussion, I actually wanted to thank you on the on the record for literally changing the way I think. Thank you so much. I remember you had sent me a lovely email enunciating similar sentiments and you don't know how rewarding it is to hear such words because that's ultimately why we do the things that we do as professors. We want to uh, introduce good ideas that will hopefully influence people in a positive way. So to hear that from you is very enriching. Thank you. All right. Uh, so Dr. Saad, let's start with this. Now, if we compare this book to the previous one, which was The Consuming Instinct, there is, uh, while we are still talking about, uh, you know, why mind viruses and you, you use a lot of scientific evidence, but still this is, a, in a social way, this is quite a shift from uh, what you had covered in The Consuming Instinct. So so what was the reasoning behind writing The the Parasitic Mind or uh, or what, what was happening, let's say, uh, in the cultural zeitgeist that made you decide, you know what, I have to write a book on this and enunciate these principles in a very systematized scientific manner? Sure. Uh, so I, in, in chapter one of The Parasitic Mind, I basically trace my trajectory my, of my childhood in Lebanon and the civil war that we faced. And I argue that there are really two great wars that have shaped my life. The first one being, uh, you know, Le the Lebanese civil war, where as Lebanese Jews, we had to escape after the first year of the civil war because it was no longer feasible to be Jewish in Lebanon. And that's where I really got to experience firsthand the horrors of identity politics, because in Lebanon, everything is determined by your religious affiliation, uh, who sits as prime minister and whose president is determined by the religion that you belong to. And so in a sense, I was already well uh, versed on the horrors of identity politics. The second great war that I faced happened much later when I first was a, a graduate student and then when I became a professor in 1994, where I would see the systematic attack, war, intellectual terrorism on, on reason, on logic, on science, on even common sense, folk psychology. And so this is really, in a sense, this book has been brewing in my head for you know 25 plus years uh, and so i decided finally to put it all together in this book and maybe i can can i just describe very briefly what the book is about so that people get sure, a sense sure yeah so as an evolutionary psychologist one of the things that uh, i do is to look for comparisons across other species so if i want to for example demonstrate that uh, toy preferences in within human infants exist because of biological reasons well, then we could study vervet monkeys and rhesus monkeys and chimpanzees to show that they exhibit the same sex-specific toy preferences. And so one of the tools that evolutionary psychologists use is the field of comparative psychology. Comparative meaning we compare across species. 
And so as I was thinking about what is it that's causing people to engage in such dreadful ideas in, in, in promulgating such dreadful idea pathogens, I looked into the field of neuroparasitology. Neuroparasitology is the field that looks at parasites, but specifically parasites that end up residing, if you like, in a host's brain. So a classic example would be Toxoplasma gondii. When a mouse is infected with Toxoplasma gondii, it loses its innate fear of cats and it becomes sexually attracted to the cat's urine, which is not a good attraction to hold if you're a mouse. And so I take that principle and I analogize it to humans. But instead of arguing that, uh, you know, it's actual brain worms, I argue that there are these idea pathogens that can cause us to be led to the abyss of infinite lunacy. And so what I do in the book is I trace where these idea pathogens come from, which I guess we can discuss examples of in a second. And then I propose some vaccines, some inoculations. How could you develop a protection against disordered thinking? And so that's the idea of the whole book. All right. So Dr. Saad, I, I want to go to the first two chapters of your book now. Sure. And, and I'll tell you why I could relate to it. So I, I myself was living in Canada from the year 2000 to 2002 and three, where I was studying in York University. And while I was, you know, obviously I was listening to your book on Audible and, and while I was listening to it, I could relate to it so much at a personal level. And I'll tell you why, because in a way, you know, you start with the kind of pain and agony you faced at, at a personal level when you were in Lebanon. And I don't know, when I moved to Canada too, or when I go to Western countries in general, I just think human beings are fascinating creatures where our definition of what bothers us is very much related to the kind of surrounding we, we live in. So I remember when I moved from India to Canada, uh, there were many things that would just simply not bother me. And I would see my classmates who were maybe born and raised Canadians living around me, they would throw a fit about many things. And I would be like, why are they even bothered about this? I, because where I come from, it's just, just another day in the office. I mean, uh, it's like that. And and I could see in a way, so am I wrong in in understanding that when you were writing in a, in a very weird way, you were like, if you want to know pain, this is pain. What you guys are crying about is actually not really pain. Yeah, you're, you're exactly right. Look, you, you have to contextualize what it means to be a victim, right? Uh, and in chapter five uh, of the book, I talk about, you know, collective Munchausen and the victimology poker game and uh, oppression Olympics. And I talk about something called the homeostasis of victimology, right? So if you imagine, let's say, when you set your, um, your thermostat in your room uh, to a certain temperature, well, what does it mean for a system to be homeostatic? It means that it will adjust the temperature according to where you set it. If it's too cold, it makes it hot. If it's too hot, it makes it cold. Many systems in our body are homeostatic, right? So I take this principle and I argue that we are using a similar process in redefining victimology, right? So when we no longer have anything to complain about, we will simply redefine what constitutes rape or sexual assault or abuse so that we can always reach that desired level, which concludes that we live in a horrifyingly homophobic, racist, sexist, transphobic society. But it's all make-believe, right? And it's an attack on true victimology, right? So if you say, for example, that if a guy cat calls you as a form of verbal rape, well, you are really uh, denigrating what it means to be a rape victim, right? So mm -hmm. in your example, when you're living in India and you see some of the realities that you see and then you come to the West and you see how people get all triggered, it makes you wonder. Well, same thing with me, but which by the way, I use that personal tragedy from my life against the social justice warriors because since they like to navigate with the victimology currency, well, few people score higher on victimology poker than I do. So I turn yeah. that story against it. I, I hate to do it, but sometimes you have to use the tools of your opponent against them. And so what ends up happening is once I show someone that, wait a minute, you living at Wellesley College outside of uh, Boston at your $70,000 tuition does not qualify you as a victim. Let me tell you about what a victimhood is when you don't know if you're going to survive the next day in Lebanon, then they usually go away. So it's really a grotesque form of power currency to use your victimology to win arguments. 
So, uh, so I think this is a perfect segue into a concept that you talk about in your book, which was where you call male social justice warriors as a, a sneaky fucker, uh, sneaky yeah. fuckers. So, uh, so, so <laughs> I, I just uh, I don't know who, who was the scientist who came up with the name, but it's a hilarious name oh. in, in, in the first place. But do you think this is also in a very weird way used by a lot of people to piggyback? in a in a new sort of way because at the end of the day we are all products of our culture and if the cultural zeitgeist has shifted from the, it's like i love the way how michael shermer talks about in his book uh, he says that we've gone from a culture of individuality to a culture of victimhood where your basic uh, uh, card to showcase uh, your importance in society is how i'm a victim so do do you think there is this some sort of a uh, so how would i anal analogize this in a scientific way so are there people who are tied actually trying to exploit this in a very weird way? Right. So in 2010, I wrote a paper, a scientific paper, which I published in a medical journal where I was looking at uh, Munchausen syndrome. So let me explain what that is. So Munchausen syndrome is where someone feigns a medical illness so that they can garner empathy and sympathy. Munchausen syndrome by proxy is where you take someone who's under your care, typically your biological child, but it could be your pet, it could be your elderly parent, and you harm them so that you could garner the empathy and sympathy by proxy, right? Oh my God, I have a sick child, poor me, I'm such a loving and caring parent. So it's a really diabolical psychiatric condition that I had written about you know, 10 years ago. And as I was trying to understand the uh, victimology currency that we're seeing today, a, a light bulb, you know, lit up in my head. And this is why I call this new collective malady, collective Munchausen and collective Munchausen by proxy. So for example, when Senator Elizabeth Warren lies about her heritage and pretends that she is Native American, that's exactly what she's doing. She's piggybacking on the tragic history of a peoples so that she can garner the empathy and sympathy. Jesse Smollett, who was a successful actor making more money per episode than I do per year as a professor, wasn't satisfied with having that, having won the lottery in life. What really he needed to do was to demonstrate that he was a huge victim. And if he can't be a true victim, then he will manufacture a victimhood narrative. Now, let me contextualize that with, say, the, the upbringing that I had, because as you said, I mean, part of who we are is just our, our unique combination of genes, but part of who we are is also a product of the environment that we grew up in. And so in the book, I tell the story to, to kind of juxtapose against Jesse Smollett, a story from, from my personal life where I had just finished my MBA. So I had an under, undergrad in mathematics and computer science and had done an MBA both at McGill University. The reason I'm mentioning these is because it's relevant to the story. And so I'd, I'd, I was already, you know, a, a, a rather educated person and I was going to pursue now my additional uh, degrees, you know, finish my PhD, do my PhD, get, become a professor. And one of the places that I was accepted at was University of California, Irvine. And so they had invited me to visit to see if, I, if, if they could recruit me. And my, one of my brothers lives in Southern California or at the time lived in Southern California. And so he was trying to, you know, make me consider whether I should leave uh, academia for a while, maybe work with him, put on the proverbial suit, and then eventually I could go back to do my PhD. Uh, I, I entertained him in that I, you know, he's an older brother, so I went with him to his to his job and so on. But I always knew that I wanted to do my PhD. I come back to Montreal and uh, to visit my parents, uh, having decided, of course, that I'm just going to go on for my PhD, which I ended up doing at Cornell University. And my mother didn't know of my decision yet but she knew that my brother was trying to convince me to go work with him. And so she takes me to a room and she says, well, I heard about this uh, situation. Uh, you know, I hope that you're not going to not pursue your PhD. Do you want people to know that you are somebody who dropped out of school, right? <laughs> or from my mother's perspective, having had a bachelor's degree in mathematics and computer science and an MBA from one of the leading universities in the world would, would bring shame because I would be a school dropout. Now, of course, I didn't pursue my PhD in any reason because of her or my parents, but that gives you a sense of the standard of excellence. And we come from a true victimology narrative, right? We, My parents were kidnapped by Fatah in Lebanon. We escaped execution, and yet we didn't wallow in our victimhood. It's always setting the bar so high and trying to truly excel. 
So that gives you a sense of how different narratives can shape your life in completely different ways. Yeah, and and one thing that I could you know relate to a lot during the book was again, and I keep going back to like I, I love the chapter where you talk about non-negotiable elements in a society, and and I'll tell you why it hurts me because I live in a society when where we have blasphemy laws. It's it's very funny because the majority religion in India does not even have the concept of blasphemy, but Lo and behold, in 1915, a very peaceful religion actually had a problem and uh, we, we introduced blasphemy in India and we've not taken it off. And uh, now, uh, there, to be very honest, we don't have the concept of free speech in India. It's you have freedom to speak until the government has decided not to jail you, in my view. I mean, uh, somebody, uh, somebody in the top, if they want to jail you, there are enough laws in the books that can jail you in India. And now I see this weird sort of disease creeping uh, not so much in America, maybe, but definitely in Canada. And maybe uh, I follow Canadian politics a lot because I'm married to a Canadian. So I tend to follow Canadian politics more seriously. Uh, but w does that worry you that, you know, the one non-negotiable on which maybe uh, the Western civilization actually had a kind of a gentleman's agreement, as they say that, OK, this is the line we will not cross about free speech but even that seems to be under threat so so are you actually worried about that i'm very worried i mean my 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 wife always tells me you know you already lead a very busy and stressful life as a professor just you know pursuing your career as a professor why do you need to take up this mat this big mantle this big battle it, it just stresses you it angers you well i take it up for several reasons one because i have children and i may not be fighting for me but i'm fighting for for my children and yours, because I know what a society looks like that 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 falls into tribal tribalism, into superstition, into lack of freedom of speech, and so on. And so I don't want that to be the case in the West. I mean, think about if the West were to no longer have these enshrined values, where would people like me run to, right? Uh, you know, I'm forever grateful to Canada because I was able to escape a hellhole and come to a place where I was able to flourish uh, and, and so on. So, so I'm, I'm, of course, I am very worried. But also, you know, one thing that I, that's worth uh, stating is, you know, why is it that I am so indignant about these realities? I, I suspect many people are worried about these realities, yet they don't speak out. And I always give the following uh, explanation. I have a very exacting code of personal conduct. So when I go to bed at night and I put my uh, head on my pillow, I need to know that I've done everything that I could, however big or however small, to contribute against these disordered ways of thinking, that I have contributed in whichever way that I can to protect our societies from all of these you know, cretinous ideas. If I don't do that, then I wouldn't be able to sleep because I would feel like a fraud. And so in a sense, this very brutal and exacting code of conduct compels me to always speak out because I don't really have a choice in the matter. It's really my genes that are telling me uh, speak out. So, so, and let me just make one small analogy. If, if you, if you hear a, of a woman being accosted violently in a um, alley, uh, you could be one of two individuals. You could pretend that you didn't hear her cries and keep walking uh, because you don't want to be involved. Uh, maybe you're scared that, you know, you'll be hurt. Or you're the guy who says, you know, I'm hearing somebody screaming for help. I need to intervene. Well, I'm the guy who intervenes. And I wish that more people would have that reflex because if we were, if we would all intervene when we hear truth being murdered in the alley of academia, that's where it starts from, then we wouldn't have all of these pathogenic ideas spreading everywhere. So Dr. Saad, now let's talk about ostrich parasitic syndrome. Now. Sure. It's a, it's a word that you've coined and made famous now. Uh, obviously, I mean, I heard about it on your channel uh, for the first time when you had uh, when you've used it mu on multiple occasions. But obviously, a major part of the of the chapter talks about denialism. To be very honest, when it comes to Islamism, and uh, now actually, again, in a very weird way, both you and I can uh, relate to this in a in a very close manner because both of us have lived in societies where Islam has been, uh, you know, there right beside us, amongst us. Muslims have been amongst us. I have Muslim family members. I mean, we've had uh, family members who are married to Muslims, and yet, uh, and and I and I, this is the way it happens everywhere in the world where. 
I don't know what has happened, but in in some weird way, there is this denialism when it comes to Islam. So you've explained it obviously beautifully in this chapter when you talk about ostrich parasitic syndrome. But but uh, let's leave the denialism and of Islam as 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 a separate issue. But if if I was to ask you to explain this in a scientific manner, how would we talk about ostrich parasitic syndrome? Let's say even if we were not thinking about Islamism. So uh, it's it's a form of disordered thinking that is akin to doing la 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 la. I can't hear you, right? And that form of denialism—that's uh, exactly the correct word—manifests itself in many ways. So uh, when I start off the chapter on OPS on ostrich parasitic syndrome, I talk about science denialism. So if you like, science denialism is subsumed within OPS because it is one of many types of denialism right so for example when you reject when you have one of the idea pathogens that i talk about is biophobia so biophobia is the fear of using biology to explain human affairs or as you earlier mentioned you know don't you dare say that anything above the neck is due to evolution well that's a form of denialism right rejecting sex differences as being in part biologically based is a form of denialism some forms of denialism lead to many millions of people dying lysenkoism which was a quack genetic theory by lysenko in uh, in the former soviet union where he was trying to impose a marxist view on genetics rather than actually what genetic the laws of genetics were uh, caused the famine of many millions of people so the the capacity for the human mind to engage in denialism occurs across many domains so I put all of that under the rubric of a collective malady, which I call ostrich parasitic syndrome. Ostrich being the, the metaphor of the ostrich burying its head in the sand, which it doesn't actually do, but burying the head in the sand so that it doesn't face reality. Parasitic, again, because these are parasitic ideas that have real ill consequences to those who engage in this form of denialism. And so if I may just link it to Islam, because it's that's the main example that I give. Uh, so look, uh, I can show a, you know, a bien pensant. In French, we say bien pensant, like a, a a nuanced thinker. But it's kind of I use it sarcastically. I could use I could show a, a politically correct colleague a video of a terrorist who's about to go blow up a cafeteria, and on that video he lists on seventeen different occasions the exact reasons, because it's a public proclamation. This is why I'm going to do this. It's because of this article of my faith, this passage, this thing. So in 17 different ways, he states that he is doing this in the defense and in the pursuit of his uh, religious uh, tenets. Then you sit back and you listen to what Westerners come up with as excuses that suggests that he wasn't really doing it for because of Islam. It's because of lack of art exposure. It's because of beard bullying. It's because of British colonialism. It's because of the Zionist occupation. It's because of solar panels, right? The Bill Nye, the science guy, uh, and I, I, I give the full quote in the book, uh, went on a show where he drew a full causality between the attack in Bataclan in Paris to climate change. So this is what we mean by OPS. We could be fully loving of most Muslims, all Muslims who are nice and kind and liberal. And as you said, I have more Muslim, fr Muslim friends than most people will ever meet in their lives without engaging in such denialism. And so it, it's what I call chewing gum and walking at the same time. I could support equity feminism, which is the idea that men and women should be equal under the law. Any reasonable person would agree to this without accepting militant feminism, which argues that there are no sex differences between men and women, all are due to social construction, and we are indistinguishable beings. So in the pursuit of a noble cause, I don't have to murder truth. And so that's a common theme throughout all of these idea pathogens. So, so the, the key word, Dr. Saad, you left me was with truth. And, and that's the problem when it comes to the discourse these days, especially, I don't know how to say it, but the truth is genuinely under assault. I mean, and uh, maybe one of my favorite uh, things, uh, not just in this book, but I think you have introduced this concept and uh, 
I think it has been there on your channel in the form of multiple presentations too, where you call it the nomological network of cumulative evidence. Uh, and you have a dedicated chapter to it in the, uh, in the book. But the truth is uh, what matters, right, Dr. Saad? And the truth is under assault. Uh, or, I don't know what your opinion is, but it's it's in a very weird way because both you and I are uh, irreligious people in that sense that we are both disbelievers. But I mean, we got rid of the old religion. We've kind of gotten this new godless faith, uh, which is crept into universities in the form of postmodernism. Do you think it is a religion? And how do we deal with the assault on the truth from this new religion then? Yeah, so a couple of questions. Uh, I'll first answer the last one, and then I think it's worth going back and explaining what nomological networks of cumulative evidence. So thank you for asking that question. Uh, it is a form of religion because a religion starts off with some revealed truths that are uh, impervious to falsification, right? And so that's exactly what happens with uh, these types of progressive, excuse me, progressive ideas. Uh, so it is akin to a religion, right? You are not allowed to violate certain progressive tenets. Diversity, inclusion, and equity, the die religion, is something that is sacrosanct. Anybody who questions it is a vile um, you know, Nazi. Uh, so yes, of course, it is a form of secular quasi-religion. Now, when it comes to nomological networks of cumulative evidence, I argue that in the same way that Charles Darwin used you know, several decades of data to demonstrate his theory of evolution. He, you know, he didn't just collect data from undergrads at uh, Ohio State. He looked at paleontology and geology and comparative morphology and ecology. And he put all that data together to arrive to a tsunami of evidence in support of his uh, theory. I argue we have to use a similar epistemological tool in establishing the veracity of a theory. And I give several examples in the book. So if I want to show to you that toy preferences are, as I mentioned earlier, uh, due to certain biological reasons, I could show you children who are too young to be socialized that already exhibit those toy preferences. So it couldn't have been due to socialization. I could show you other animals that exhibit the exact same toy preferences. I could show you little girls who suffer from uh, adrenal, uh, congenital adrenal hyperplasia uh, which is an endocrinological disorder that masculinizes the behavior of little girls, and they exhibit behaviors that are similar to boys. So bit by bit, I could build this nomological network of cumulative evidence from many different disciplines, different time periods, different cultures, different frameworks, different methodologies, which when you put it all together becomes a tsunami of evidence that is incontrovertible. So, And I tell people that when you're making, when you're having debates about important topics, don't be hysterical, don't be emotional, build the nomological network. So if you were to ask me, for example, hey, Professor Saad, what, what are your views on the legalization of marijuana? My answer would be one of epistemic humility. I would say, you know what? I don't know enough about that topic. I haven't built the requisite nomological network that would allow me to answer you definitively, so I'll pass. So part of being a truth seeker, as I think maybe Confucius originally said, if I can paraphrase it, is to know what you know and, and know what you don't know. So when I've built the, the relevant nomological network, I walk with the swagger of someone who knows. And when I don't know, I will bow my head and I say, you know, frankly, I don't know enough about this topic. So what I'm doing there is I'm imploring people to not use their affective system when trying to adjudicate these debates, which, is, which goes back to something I discussed in chapter two when I talk about thinking versus feeling. It's not that humans are thinking animals or humans are feeling animals. We are both, except that we have to know when to activate the correct system. When I'm drive, when I'm walking down an, a dark alley because I'm trying to take a shortcut to get home and I see four young men loitering and my heart starts racing and my blood pressure goes up and I start perspiring because I'm feeling fearful, that's my emotional system that's been activated and it makes perfect evolutionary sense. If I'm trying to solve a calculus problem, all of my emotional hysteria is not going to help me solve the integral problem, right? So when I use which system is what matters. And so this is what I do in chapter seven when I'm trying to teach people how to seek truth is to use this powerful epistemological tool. So Dr. Saad, one, one last question uh, sure. before I let, let, let you go. Uh, you said epistemic humility, the, 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 
the the courage and i think one needs courage to say when they say i don't know uh how uh, so a lot of young people are going to be watching this uh, what would you tell these people we live in the age of social media where the social currency seems to be having unlimited number of opinions on everything under the sun in and and that's what gets your attention basically that's how the the entire zeitgeist somehow on the digital block you know sphere has been built built up for that matter now in such an atmosphere uh, dr sad how would you teach people to say and understand the value of i don't know yeah that's a great question look uh, when i'm let's say i get up in front of a lecture of under, you know in front of undergraduates and a student raises you know raises their hand i take their question they ask a question and i say hey what well, you know what that's a great question you know what i don't know why don't you send me an email and remind me of this question so i could look uh, at the answer that right there is an incredibly important moment in our uh, interaction because it establishes trust because it shows that this guy who is sitting up on his professorial pedestal wasn't epistemologically arrogant enough to try to BS me when he knows he seems to really know what he's talking about and when he didn't know he said in front of the whole class you know what i really don't know the answer to this question so i would tell people to the extent that you truly care about having an impact in the battle of ideas your reputation you you know whether you exude trust is terribly important i mean think about the number of uh, places that i've spoken at i mean at this point i don't know hundreds of millions of views if you put everything together so imagine how assured i need to be of all my positions so that till now no one has caught me anywhere right why because i'm always very comfortable in who i am and what i know and what i don't know when i know something i'm willing to defend it till till the proverbial death and one of the things i talk about in chapter 8 is to activate your inner honey badger right the honey badger is an incredibly ferocious and and uh, and fierce animal it's the size of a small dog and yet it could withstand the approach of you know six adult lions well how could it do that because it's so fierce it's intimidating well i argue that you need to have that kind of ideological honey badger in you which basically means that when you come at me and i can defend my principles because they are well reasoned and well articulated I am relentless in coming back after you. This is why I survive. People say, "Well, how come you never get canceled? You live in the most poisonous cesspool, which is academia, and yet you say all these unbelievably irreverent things and you don't get canceled." Well, because I walk like the king of the honey badgers. So what I would tell young people is, you know, arm yourself with knowledge, be humble when you know walk with bravado. So I'm not saying humil- humility is not lack of self-confidence. a lot of people say i'm if anything i exude a lot of confidence maybe too confident maybe my ego is too big but reality is i'm not egotistical because when i know i know and when i don't know i bow my head and hopefully you will teach me and so that's a wonderful quality to have it will serve you well in all relationships in life so that's what i'd have to say All right Dr. Sad so I guess it's time to wrap things up but before I go I wanted to ask you uh what's next so uh, have you decided what uh, the next book that's going to come up or uh, oh, yeah. or what's in what's in store for us Yeah so I have uh I oh, wow. I basically had a have about three possible book ideas there is one that's way ahead in terms of leading of the three so I've already started to work on the book prospectus so for your viewers who may not know a book prospectus is where you're basically putting together the sales pitch of your next book which you will then shop to your publishers right so uh here is what the book idea is about here's what the synopsis is here's what some competitor books are in within this area here you know and so on so it's 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 like doing a a a full sales pitch of your book idea so i'm already starting to work on maybe i shouldn't be starting to work on it. maybe i need to rest after this book but uh one of the beauties of what i do is uh, and i hope that everybody finds such passion is that i'm like a kid in a candy store i wake up every day with incredible excitement because there are so many intellectual landscapes to visit and so without giving you any details but to answer your question yes i am working on the next book it's not at all in the culture war areas rather it's about a prescription to lead a good life 
I'm certainly looking forward to that. Uh, 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 you know, uh, your books are interesting to me at a personal level is uh, is because these are complex concepts. Uh, evolutionary psychology, maybe somebody picked up a Martin Daly or Margot Wilson. It's not that easy to understand what they're saying. One has to read them again and again. And what I loved about the, I said, not only this book, but even the one previous to that, The Consuming Instinct, was that it was so easy to understand. I mean, once you pick up the book, you can get the concepts very clearly and then you can go forward. So, you know, at least from myself in India and whoever is going to be watching this, I want to take this opportunity uh, uh, for, uh, you know, to thank you for writing these books and uh, teaching us all these interesting concepts, Dr. Zed. Oh, thank you so much. You're very kind. I truly enjoyed our chat. Thank you for having me on. All right, guys, it's time to wrap things up. So Dr. Saad's YouTube channel is link and the links to buy his book are going to be in the description of the video. Also in the audio version, I'm going to add all the links over there. I insist not just you buy this book, but I insist you buy the previous books too, because if you do buy the previous books, it actually helps you understand a lot of terminologies that Dr. Saad uses because it gets you an understanding of his terms, the way he thinks. So, and if you like what I'm doing over here, please subscribe, share, and uh, leave your comments over there. If you like what I'm doing, you can become a member or support me on Patreon. Until then, I'll see you next time. Namaste. Take care. Goodbye.